Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, to the prospective students and parents who have joined us for this afternoon's webinar. My name is John Mahoney. I'm the Vice Provost for Enrollment Management here at Boston College. I'm joined by my colleague from the Office of Financial Aid here at Boston College. Her name is Melissa Metcalf. She's the Associate Director for Financial Aid and she will be making the presentation this afternoon. And at the end of the presentation, we will certainly save time for your questions and answers. So while I would encourage you to wait a few minutes to watch the beginning of the presentation as Melissa moves through her slides, uh, if questions are occurring to you that are not addressed, please use the Q&A function and we will try to address as many of those questions by the end of the hour. Uh, thanks again. We're, we're delighted that you've joined us this afternoon. We know uh, that a lot of you are uh, on the verge of sending in applications to Boston College, either for early decision or for regular decision. We know this has been a challenging cycle for all of you students in particular. You were uprooted from school in March. Uh, you've really not had the opportunity to visit college campuses through the summertime and even into the fall. We're not able to welcome visitors to our campus us, unfortunately. We do hope you've taken advantage of a lot of our programming, whether it be information sessions or campus tours or webinars like these, just helpful webinars such as uh, the importance of applying for financial aid. But we are with you. We are hopeful that you will continue to watch our website, take advantage of the programming that's available to you, and certainly be in touch with the undergraduate admission office if we can be of assistance to you in any way. This afternoon's presentation is obviously extremely important to families because as important as higher education is, <clears throat> it is also expensive. And that's true whether you're looking at public institutions or private institutions. Uh, uh, applying to, to college and paying for college is a significant commitment on, a part, uh, on the part of any family. Uh, and private higher education is uh, expensive uh, at an even higher degree, certainly. We really do believe, and I'm sure all of you, because you're tuning in this afternoon, believe that while it is a cost, it is also a huge investment, an investment in your future, perhaps an investment that's even more important today than it was in the past, because we live in a world where technology is so rapidly changing the way that we live and work. And of course, we're now living through a pandemic, which has also upended uh, the economic and employment climate in so many ways. So it's all, all the more underscores the importance of a great education and really thinking about it as an investment in your future uh, and, and being able to uh, uh, live a successful and a happy and a meaningful life. Here at Boston College, we're particularly proud of the results that we've achieved through the years Every year we track uh, what happens to our classes when they graduate. We don't have the data yet on the class for, of 2020, but we do know, do know from our class of 2019, uh, we do a six month out survey of every graduating class and the class of 2019 pretty much uh, followed suit with previous classes. Uh, uh, six months out, 73% of the class of 2019 uh, was, was full-time employed. Another 18% were attending graduate school full-time. Another 5% were involved in post-baccalaureate uh, fellowships uh, or service opportunities. Uh, and so 95% of our students were engaged in meaningful employment, education, or service work six months after graduation. That's pretty standard for, for a Boston College graduating class. Uh, median income for our, our employed graduates one year out of college is about $60,000. So we're, we're very confident that if you come to Boston College, uh, this is going to be provide you that pathway to graduate school or to the job that you want. Finally, um, as a segue into Melissa's presentation, we're also quite proud of the fact that uh, we subscribe to two principles in terms of financial aid. Uh, the first is that the admission office pledges to be completely need blind uh, in the way that we review applications. And what that means is that we're credential based. We're evaluating students, what they've achieved in the classroom, what they've achieved outside of the classroom, who they are and what they would contribute to this Boston College community. So uh, a family's ability to pay or not pay does not affect admission decisions in any way. It is simply credential-based admission. Secondarily though, we also pledge to meet the full demonstrated need of every student that we accept. And today across this country, there are just 20 private universities in the country that subscribe to that policy and 18 private liberal arts colleges. So these are institutions that really are committed to enrolling the very best students, regardless of their family's ability to pay. We want the best students, 
regardless of your, your financial circumstances. Because of our commitment to, financial, to, to need based financial aid, which the university spends about $150 million on per year for undergraduate students, we do very little in the way of merit based scholarships. And I know that a lot of families tuning in today might be interested in exploring merit based scholarships, but Boston College does very little in that regard. We do have one extraordinary program, however, that I would direct you uh, to look at on our website. It is called the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. We do award 15 Gabelli Presidential Scholarships each year. That is a guaranteed full tuition scholarship each year. So that's about $56,000, $57,000 this year. The total cost at Boston College is about $76,000. So if you're interested in that Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program and wanna see what kinds of requirements it, 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 it has, do look it up on our website and do be aware of the fact that we do have a priority scholarship deadline for be con being considered for that Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. You'd have to have a completed application on file with us by the 1st of November, okay? So with that, I'm really pleased to welcome my colleague, Melissa Metcalf, who's going to take you through the financial aid process at Boston College. We look forward to fielding your questions. Melissa, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Thanks, John, for having me. Um, as John said, my name is Melissa, and I'm going to share my screen with you right now so we can start. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Hold on. Bear with me for a second, I'm so sorry. Okay, sorry about that. All right, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm the Associate Director for Undergraduate Financial Aid here at Boston College, and I'm gonna take you through our um, financial aid application process, how the aid's determined, our awarding process, um, and then a little bit about um, how to pay the bill. If you have any questions during this, um, presentation, we not only will save time for the end, but you're welcome to use the Q&A feature. Um, we do have people behind the scenes answering some of those questions, and um, we certainly will get to as many as we can for the end of the presentation. So Boston College um, does not specifically have a financial aid office. We're actually part of the Office of Student Services, which also includes um, the student account registrar, credit and collection, campus-based loans, and then some auxiliary services like ID and parking. Uh, we are located in Lyons Hall um, in middle campus, right in the center of everything, um, across from the admissions building. Uh, and this is, we, we are open right now, um, and we do have limited staff. The financial aid team is working remotely, and we'll take any questions, certainly, um, by email or Zoom um, or by phone. Um, on this screen is just some contact information. Uh, all of this is available on most of our literature, so don't feel like you need to scramble to write it down. Um, when applying for financial aid, you want to send your documents directly to our upload feature, which is at bc.edu slash finaid upload. Um, that is new to, new to us this year, or um, there is a PO box um, that I, sh I should have updated my presentation. We did we took it down for um, this pandemic, but there is a PO box to also send documentation also on all of our literature. So applying for financial aid, um, as I'm sure you're learning quickly, um, every school requires that you fill out the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA. This was available as um, recently as October 1st. So I do encourage families to fill out this application as soon as possible, particularly if you're planning on doing early decision here at Boston College. Um, it is a free application and um, it gives you opportunity to download your tax data from the IRS. So um, you don't have to remember it off the top of your head, but it certainly can be done um, by using your paper taxes. Boston College in awarding their own money also uses another application called the CSS Profile. This stands for College Scholarship Services. I'm sure you're all familiar with this through the SAT and the ACT. Um, it can be found at collegeboard.com. Um, there is a fee to filling out this application, but a lot of schools like Boston College that are awarding their own grant money use this in order to determine eligibility for institutional funds. Both of these are required at Boston College for freshman year. And then this year, um, the federal government through by way of the FAFSA um, requires the family to use prior prior year tax data. So this year it will be 2019 taxes. 
some schools only require the um, FAFSA with the IRS data transfer. Um, however, Boston College does require that you actually submit the documents um, as well, not just the transfer of information from the IRS. So all of those um, application materials should be sent in as soon as possible. Um, I know there's a November 1st deadline for early decision, um, but the sooner you get your documents in, the sooner we're able to review and determine your eligibility. This is just um, a slide with a timeline to give you a sense of what happens here at Boston College. Um, if you are applying ED1, you should hear from not only admissions, but financial aid in December at some time, at some point. Um, February would be the, the timeline for early decision two. Uh, March, as um, standard for most schools, is when the regular decision um, admissions decisions would be made and when you'd review awards for regular decision. Um, May 1st is the national deposit deadline. So you'll have till then to make your decisions after comparing awards from one school to the next. Um, here at Boston College, we also uh, have a validation or a federal verification form that we require. Um, and it's also the time to start signing up for a payment plan if interested. Again, here at BC, June is when our first bill goes out. We'll send another one in July. That the balance is due mid-August for the fall semester. We then will start um, in November sending spring bills, and unfortunately, right in time for the holidays, um, this spring bill for the spring semester is due in December. And just as a quick note, this is also when we start the cycle all over again for returning undergrads um, and uh, with the financial aid application. So as John mentioned here at Boston College, our financial aid um, is predominantly need-based. Um, and what that means uh, is the, the need-based philosophy assumes that the parent and the student are primary, primarily responsible for paying or financing the college costs, and the university is here to supplement that process. Um, we determine the family's need for assistance through uh, standard methodologies, uh, and that, me that, that formula, that methodology, is a measure of what a family is expected to contribute toward a student's education for that year. Also, as John mentioned, Boston College is committed to meeting 100% of the demonstrated institutional need for each student that applies. Um, we do so in, um, with the combination of grants, loan, and work. So it's a combination of the federal and institutional aid. And this past year, 1920, we um, awarded over 140 million, um, and we've awarded even more this year. But uh, as John mentions, num numbers aren't complete as of yet um, for this this coming year as far as tallying up how much we've spent. But as you can see, it's a huge commitment to um, meeting the need of our students and we plan on doing so for years to come. A little bit about um, the vocabulary that you're, you'd hear in the process of um, applying for financial aid. Most financial aid administrators speak in acronyms and many people have no idea what we're talking about. So. Uh, if you understand the vocabulary, you might understand a little bit of what we're trying to do here. Um, the cost of attendance is kind of what the financial aid is based around, and that is an estimated budget that includes tuition, fees, room, board, books, supplies, personal expenses, and transportation. Here at BC, we have a cost of attendance for living on campus, living off campus, or commuting from home. The expected family contribution, or the EFC, is a measure of what that family is expected to contribute toward that cost of attendance for that one year that you've applied. And the other piece that you'll hear quite a bit is the word need. Uh, and need is actually just another word for eligibility. Um, and then that is simply the difference between the cost of attendance and the EFC. This is what we do in the financial aid office. We take the cost of attendance for each student, we subtract the expected family contribution that's been determined through our standard formulas and we determine your financial need for eligibility. And with that, that eligibility figure is how we build the financial aid package. So this is an example of what um, a financial aid award would look like here at Boston College. Um, it certainly is prettier online when you receive it, but um, the cost of attendance, say it's $79,000, it's pretty close to that. Um, so we're using that for every incoming freshman um, in theory. 
for this particular family, their expected family contribution was determined to be $35,000. So they're expected to pay for that year $35,000 from the resources that they've demonstrated in the formula. We take the EFC, subtract it from the cost of attendance, and that gives us a need or an eligibility of $44,000. The $44,000 is that need for assistance that Boston College will use to build a package, and we will do so through loan, work, and grant. And so in this case, the student as an incoming freshman would get $2,700 in work study, $3,500 in a subsidized direct loan, and direct loan is um, just a, it's, was formerly known as the Stafford Loan for all of you who might have taken financial aid in, in uh, college. And then the difference would be met with grant money from Boston College. And in this case, it would be $37,800. And those funds would be dispersed over the course of the year, half in the fall and half in the spring. So the work study um, is really, in the award, it's a placeholder. Um, it's, it's money set aside for the student to earn weekly by, um, through hours worked. The students are paid through direct deposit, so they would need a checking or a savings account. Um, positions are filled through applications and interviews with the student um, and the between the student and the department directly. Um, and those are usually available open opening weekends. Um, we do have work study um, jobs available right now, even in a pandemic. So certainly by next year, um, we should be in, in even better shape. Students must have original documentation, just like you and I when we're applying for a job, um, to fill out their I-9 and their W-4 and M-4. So that means a social security card, a birth certificate, a passport. These are all important things to have if the student plans on working. These links on the screen here, um, one is our student employment webpage. Certainly visit it and check out what might be available for current students. Um, and then if the student doesn't get work study or has other um, ideas about where they want to work, there is a link for off-campus um, availability from local families, vendors, um, that sort of thing. The direct loans, as I mentioned, it used to be called the Stafford loan. There's two different kinds, the subsidized and the unsubsidized. Right now, currently the interest rate is 2.75% fixed, so that's an excellent rate. Um, so it certainly makes sense for you to be taking full advantage of the federal um, aid before you went to something private through a lender. Um, or credit cards or anything like that, you certainly would want to take advantage of, of the subsidized direct loan. Um, it is, um, the, the interest rate is reset annually, July 1st. There is an origination fee um, affiliated with it, but it's pretty low at 1.057%. Um, and that is reset annually in October. So both interest and principal for these um, subsidized and, direct, um, and unsubsidized loans are um, deferred through enrollment. And repayment of the principal and interest begins six months after the student ceases to be enrolled. So in most cases, that's graduation. The difference between the sub and the unsub is that the subsidized, the interest is um, being subsidized or paid during the time the student's enrolled by the federal government, whereas the unsubsidized, that interest is accruing um, while the student is enrolled, but at 2.75%, so not too bad. Um, so those are just a little bit about the components um, of the financial aid award. And obviously the grant is grant money. It doesn't need to be repaid. Um, another resource for families to definitely keep in mind is um, any outside aid or outside resource. And this is anything that comes from um, anywhere other than the university and the state or the federal government. Um, so this could be from your employer. This could be from the Knights of Columbus. That could be from Boosters or the local grocery store down the street. Um, there's uh, plenty of resources out there and the best place for students to be looking for these is through their high school guidance office. Most high schools have a book or an online um, application um, and there's thousands of dollars available for students each year um, and they should take advantage of it. Um, financial aid offices, not just at Boston College, but all schools are required to count any outside, um, outside aid, outside scholarship as a resource within the financial aid award, which means we have to put it in the award um, along with the work loan and grant that you may or may not be getting. Um, we try to do this in the least penalizing way as possible by replacing loan and work before we would um, touch the grant money but um, it does really depend on how much the student's receiving um, each year and how uh, to, to determine how that would be treated. So as soon as you find out about those outside scholarships, you should be notifying the financial aid office. 
Um, I think the question for most families as well, if you count it, is it even worth it for me to, to go through the, the, the work of doing it? And my answer to that would be absolutely. Um, like I said, we do replace work and loan before we would touch any grant money. Um, in some schools, it may be unmet need that's able to be met. Um, and certainly, you know, every cent counts against going um, towards paying that bill. So, and most of the time they require an essay that the students have already written for the Common App or other financial, I mean, other admissions applications. So my, my answer would be yes, they are worth the work. So I know I'm going so fast. I'm hopefully you're, you're asking, you're keeping your questions or um, typing them into the Q&A feature. Um, so we've talked about the financial aid awards and we've talked about any kind of outside resources that may help, but now you have a, possibly have a balance that's due. And um, the question on everyone's mind is how am I going to pay for that? So I use this slide um, to talk about past, present and future income as ways to pay um, the bill. But I, the, the part of this that I want you to also realize is this is actually how the need analysis works as well. We're looking at past, present and future income. So that's exactly how you should be thinking about paying the bill. So the past income would be any savings or assets that you have. Present income would be any salary coming into the household right now um, that could be used as a payment plan possibly. Um, and then future income is your borrowing power. And so this could be done through financing um, the, the balance owed. So here's an example of what, um, what each of those um, ideas would, be, would look like and a combination of, of um, a few of them. So say your balance owed was $10,000. If you decided to do a payment plan, which is um, a very popular um, way to pay the bill here at Boston College, there's no um, finance charge each month. It's just a one-time um, enrollment fee annually. Um, but say you wanted to, to um, use a payment plan for the $10,000, that would be $1,000 a month over 10 months. It would start in May and end in February. I think that's 10 months. Um, so if that's something your family can afford, that's a really great way to do it. Um, it's out of pocket, there's no interest accruing, um, and it, takes, it gives you the opportunity to, to use the course of the entire year to pay the bill. But if that's not doable for, um, for your particularly fa particular family, you do have the option to borrow a loan. Um, there are several types of loans, parents um, and student loans. Um, in this scenario, we've used the direct plus loan, the federal plus loan, which is the parent version of, of the direct loan we just talked about. Um, I use this in the example because I know what the interest rate is. It's also a fixed rate that's set annually. Um, I will say um, as a caveat here though, that it's not the best loan that's out there. So please look around and make sure that you're, you're um, looking at what's best for your family. But I, I use it because it's, there's a fixed rate that I know um, I know what it is every year. So if you wanted to finance the $10,000 at the 5.3% um, fixed interest rate for the PLUS loan, over the course of a 10-month repayment period, that would be $107 and change um, every month for 10 years. Um, keep, in note, keep in mind that there, there is an origination fee um, attached to that loan. So it's, like I said, not the best loan in the world, but it's still um, a, a good a tool for a lot of families um, to take advantage of. Say that you can afford more than $107, you can do a combination of both. Um, you can pay some through a monthly payment plan, maybe 5,000, so that would be 500 a month over 10 months, and then you finance 5,000, which would be $53 and change each month over the 10 years. So that ends up being under $600 a month. So it's more than the 100, but less than the 1,000. So you see from these examples that depending on what the, the financial situation for your family is, there are options to paying the bill um, and you can do whatever works for your family. So if financing is something that you're interested in doing, like I said, there's many opportunities um, at private lenders or, um, oh, I just lost the credit union, sorry, um, uh, for every family to take advantage of. They are credit-based. Um, there are parent loans and student loans. I will say that um, most student loans are going to require a cosigner at this point. 
post um, 2008, I don't know a lender that will um, lend to a student with no credit without a co-signer. Um, so here are some factors to consider when choosing a loan. Um, first of all, you wanna determine whether the loan is a federal loan or a private loan. The loan that I used in the example is a federal loan. And the federal loans um, have some uh, repayment options to them that private loans don't. But with that, they tend to have a higher interest rate. So neither one is better than the other, but there are things to consider um, and you should know who you're repaying. Um, the second would be the interest rate for obvious reasons. The higher the interest rate, the more you're paying over time. Um, but there are, there are different types of interest rates. There's a fixed, um, there's a variable, and um, for those that don't know what that means, the fixed rate, it's fixed during the time that you've borrowed that loan. The PLUS loan, for instance, is um, reset every um, July, but most private loans have, a, if, if you choose the fixed option, it's fixed for the time um, uh, till repayment. The variable loan is changing. Um, it depends on um, what kind of rate you have, but this can be a risk for families. Right now, these variable rates are really low, but um, there's no guarantee that it will stay that way. So depending on what works best for your family, um, you, there are options. The next piece is you want to um, know who the primary borrower is. Um, if the, in, like I mentioned, if the primary borrower is the student, you're gonna need a cosigner from a parent, but this affects the rate. The primary borrower is the one that drives the interest rate amount. If the student is the primary borrower versus the parent, not only is the parent going to have to cosign it, but the, you're going to get a higher interest rate. So think about those things before you sign the dotted line, so to speak. Another important factor is when does loan repayment begin? Um, for students, most loans are deferred through the time they're enrolled in college, so they don't begin, begin repayment until after they graduate. Parent loans are different, and they often, unless you specifically select a deferred option, they go into repayment immediately, which in, in the loan world means 45 to 60 days after the, the, the loan is dispersed in full. So that would be the second disbursement in the springtime. So you're looking about going into repayment late February, early March of the year the student's in school. So that's something that you need to be prepared to, to take on. You're gonna start paying that loan while the student's enrolled in school in, in the um, late winter. You wanna know how much the monthly payment's going to be. Again, for obvious reasons, we went over the combinations. You have to make sure that you can actually afford that every month. And um, in some cases, you, you need to make sure you're gonna be able to afford that for every month for four years and beyond. Um, and then finally, how many years we'll be making payments. Um, the standard loan, um, the life of a loan is 10 years for educational loans, but there are several options out there. You can extend to 15, and even 20, and then once in repayment, you can certainly refinance or consolidate these loans and often stretch it to 25. Obviously, the longer the length of the loan, the more you are paying over time, but, but if that's what your family needs to lower interest rates and give yourself more time to repay it, there are those options available. Just make sure that you know what you're signing up for because you can't defer a loan halfway through. It has to be, that, that decision has to be made up front when signing the paperwork. So these are just some um, links to um, information about borrowing direct the, the student as well as any parent plus loan that you might want to, to do. It's done through the Department of Education's um, homepage, which is studentaid.gov. You sign each of these loans, both the student and the parent, depending on um, which loan you're borrowing, um, with your FAFSA ID, which is what you signed your actual FAFSA with. So keep that in mind. These are just some more resource, resources as well. These are all on our website, as well as um, literature coming from our office. Um, it's just general information about um, financial aid requirements, um, financial, how the financial aid philosophy, the different um, agencies, the FAFSA and College Board that we use. Uh, and then at the bottom, the long-term financing, Boston College has done some of the work for you already. Um, we have, um, two specific tools on our website that will help you choose a private lender if that's what you decide to do. Um, not only uh, have we listed several lenders that we participate with, um, they are local, regional, or national, but there's also a tool out there that um, can help you um, determine what loans you may be eligible for based on a soft credit check. 
I recommend checking out either one of these tools. Um, they're, they're both um, credible, well, actually one of them is called credible, but they're credible aid organizations that BC has been working with for um, numerous years. And they do, they kind of sift through a lot of that data for you. And you're able, um, particularly with the first tool, um, it's called ELM, um, you're able to compare and contrast based on what's important to you, whether that's um, interest rate or repayment terms or APR. And um, some of those, it can sift out some of that, that information for you so you can narrow down um, and be able to make a choice. We also certainly um, would take any questions regarding that in our office um, with one of the financial aid counselors if you needed help. So just some tips about um, financial aid, the financial aid process here at Boston College or any school that you may be applying to. Uh, when sending information in, you wanna make sure that you're putting your Eagle number um, or social security numbers on everything. Um, I know lots of people are concerned about sharing social security numbers, but unfortunately um, your federal financial aid is tied to your social security number, so we do have to have it. Um, but that's why we also give you an Eagle number. So you can, as long as one of them is on there and we can find you, um, there's lots of John Smiths, so to speak. So we need to know which one we're linking paperwork to. Um, you wanna pay attention to deadlines. Um, here at BC, the financial aid, there are deadlines, but we continue to award throughout the year as files are complete um, and are at the moment not in any risk of running out of money. But that's not the case for every school. Um, financial aid funds are always limited. Um, and if you miss the deadline, you miss an opportunity to be able to um, receive funding. And at some schools, this, they, they get very strict about it and it may impact your ability for all four years. So you wanna pay attention to those deadlines. Um, with that said, you don't wanna hold off fi um, filling out applications till your taxes are done. You'll want to guesstimate. Um, you're not gonna get in trouble if you answer, answer incorrect information. So you wanna make sure that you're getting your documents and your FAFSA profile in on time um, and we can correct information for you after the fact. Make sure you're keeping copies of what you sent. Although we are electronic and everything's scanned and uploaded and it's all web-based, we are still human and um, these are critical, timely, sensitive um, processes. So in order to get stuff done, um, if God forbid something got lost, we wanna make sure that we can um, get it done quickly for you. So keep a copy of what you send to us. And then finally, I think the most important question about financial aid and financing, um, not just at Boston College, but again, at any school your student um, is considering is that you need to think about how you're going to pay for this for all four years, not just this first year. Um, I know it's exciting and um, stressful and it's an anxious time and everybody just wants to get their foot in the door and get that first bill settled. But in reality, this has to be done every single year for four years. And you need to be honest and realistic about what your family is able to do. Um, you're not every school meets full need like Boston College. So um, it's a conversation the family should be having together and the students should be part of. They need to know um, the, the investment that the family is making as a whole. And then finally, ask questions. Ask everyone and anyone any question that you have. Um, you can certainly do so through this presentation because I'm almost done. Um, but if you think of something tomorrow, certainly give us a call um, at, at the Office of Student Services and someone can speak to you um, and help you answer those questions even before you're a student. Okay, so that does it for me. Um, I did fly through a lot of information, so I hope that you're taking advantage of the Q&A feature and I will turn it back to John. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, terrific presentation, uh, and I'm sure very informative for our audience. Uh, we have had people responding in real time uh, to a lot of the questions, uh, which is great. But there are a couple that we can, we can spend some time on. Um, uh, this is, I think, material that you covered to some extent. But the first one would be just sort of basic functional ones. Where is it again that students can check to see if their documents have been received? And if you could just again sort of uh, go over that, the, the, the students do have the opportunity to upload documents themselves, correct? Sure, yes they do. Um, so Boston College has a portal that the students have access to um, uh, their specific accounts, their student account, their financial aid account, their um, meal accounts, their grades, all of that, all of that is um, accessed through the um, portal Agora. Um, with their 
their eagle number and I think a date of birth. It's um, they can go into a specific spot on the portal. The address is um, bc.edu slash fin aid app but it's actually a link on their um on their portal that they can find and there they'll find out what the required documents are documents are and what documents are still um missing um oh there's also a new feature um that we've added to this um to our our document um management system uh, an upload feature, and that's bc.edu slash finade upload, also a link um, on our site that you can upload um, PDFs and um, Word docs into the system rather than mailing or faxing um, financial aid forms to our office. Perfect. Uh, there were also a couple of questions. Uh, you covered need analysis comprehensively uh, in determining uh, what the expected family contribution would be. But there was a question about how home equity factors into expected family contributions. So if a family has paid off a home or, or has significant equity, what, what, what percentage mm -hmm. of that equity might, might be expected in a typical expected family contribution? Sure, so to start, the home equity um, is included in the need analysis um, because it is thought that a family with a home is financially stronger than a family without one. However, the assets as a whole are looked at at maybe three to 6%. So we're not looking at 100% of the value of your home. We're looking at three to 6% of any equity that you may have. Um, and it, unless, unless you have significant acts, act, excuse me, assets, it's not going to have a significant impact on the total um, family contribution. Great. Um, another sort of functional question, you've referred repeatedly now to an Eagle ID, and some people understandably don't know what that is. That's because they haven't submitted their application yet. So upon Sorry. submitting uh, an application to Boston College, once we receive your Common App, uh, we will issue you uh, credentials, uh, and that will be a username, uh, and you'll have an Eagle ID, you'll, you'll reset that and have your own password, and that will enable you to check both admission documents as well as financial aid documents, uh, the status of both of those applications throughout the course of the process. So an Eagle ID is once you've initiated the application process with BC. <clears throat> uh, Melissa, um, um, of course, this is a, a timely question, of course, we're living through very challenging times with the pandemic, and um, there's a lot of, uh, job loss and job insecurity at this point. And you mentioned that with prior prior, um, the prior prior uh, uh, year policy, we would be looking at uh, a family's uh, a position uh, for uh, the taxes of 2019. What if a family's uh, income has been reduced significantly, say by half for 2020? What kind of a process do they use to bring that to the financial aid office's attention? And, and how would we proceed? And I realize these are really case by case basis. Um, yes, so we do have an appeal process. Um, there is an appeal form on our website that you're certainly welcome to access. Um, I would recommend you calling the financial aid office in student services and speaking directly with your counselor um, because each situation is different. Um, there may be ways that we can help you without going through the appeal process. Um, but if, if the case is that there's income loss, which there certainly has been um, due to this pandemic, um, there are things that we can do. Um, we do ask for, we would either use prior prior or we would use the current situation. So for this incoming class, it would be 2021. And what we would do is project earnings for that year. Um, this is easier to do for some families than others. So um, it can get tricky. It does involve a conversation with the financial aid counselor. It does involve documentation to be provided like pay stubs and, um, uh, self unemployment, um, disability, any kind of statements that you may um, be receiving for other forms of income. Um, but there are, there are things that we can do. We've, we've certainly helped quite a few people this, um, current year during this pandemic. Um, but it, it is a case by case basis. So I would recommend that if you are in a situation like that, where you're your current income is significantly different from 2019 that you should reach out to the financial aid office and talk to somebody and um, we'll, we'll do what we can to help you. Yeah. And, and I've, I've learned as well, uh, you sort of mentioned it with that response. Thank you. Um, that uh, appeal, you know, and even if it, um, 
even if a family has not encountered job loss, they do have an opportunity uh, if once they've received the package from Boston College, if for whatever reason they feel as though it's not, uh, their, their, their situation has not been considered accurately, they do have the right to appeal that. Uh, they would have an opportunity to do that and we would consider that. No guarantee that it would be expedited necessarily, but we will certainly consider appeals. Um, just along those lines too, John, um, yeah. just keep in mind that here at BC, the aid is determined using um, data like income, assets, number of people right. in the household, number of people in families, the family. So in order for us to create more eligibility in the appeal process, we have to change one of those data figures. So, um, so if there is an income loss or there's extenuating circumstances, medical expenses, a death of a parent, God forbid, those are things that we can absolutely help with. Um, unfortunately, um, it can't be just because they don't like, like the award they got, but we're willing to talk absolutely. to families and, and work with them. And oftentimes there's things that we find out just from a conversation that we can help families with. Absolutely, and, and the family would need to obviously send in additional documentation in right. order to, to make that happen. A, a very good question, and you may have covered this, but let's let's just explore it a bit further. Uh, if if a student coming to Boston College as a freshman has an older sibling in college already, um, how is that factored into the need analysis? And I certainly know, limited knowledge as I have, <laughs> that uh, we, we look at a public institution quite differently from a private institution. But uh, talk a little bit about what that does to the need analysis when you've got maybe one sibling or maybe multiple siblings in college at the same time. Yeah, believe it or not, we do often have multiple siblings in college. Um, God love the parents. Um, there is an allowance made in each of the formulas that we're using. Um, in the institutional formula, the one that is used to determine eligibility for grant money, it's not just the number in school, but it's also the cost of the, um, the school. So like John said, a higher allowance would be made for a sibling in a four-year private institution than would be made at a four-year public or a community college. Um, and that seems to be obvious as to why, why it does that. But um, there are allowances made. We do confirm the enrollment of the student. Um, so it's not taking the expected family contribution and dividing it in half per, per se, but it, there is a significant um, allowance made um, in most cases. And again, it's it depends on the family and the income and the number of kids, um, but there is an allowance made. Um, and we, that certainly would be taken into consideration when the initial award is done. With that said, I would also mention that keep in mind if that sibling graduates, that also may, changes the financial aid award and we would be removing that student from school. That's always um, a big shock to families when that happens. We make allowances for siblings in school, but we also take them out when they graduate. So just keep that in mind um, as the sibling moves through their college career. Great. Uh, another question and one that we hear often, uh, you, you mentioned in your presentation that the first responsibility for paying for college, of course, falls to the parents. Uh, what are the circumstances uh, that would warrant um, uh, you, the, the, the student being the, re, the responsible party. In other words, I guess independent status. Uh, if, if the student were going to be the person making the contribution, what kinds of criteria would be necessary to, for, for the parents to be uh, freed from having to pay uh, and, and, and it falling to the student? So to, for a student to be considered independent, there's actually very specific um, criteria that's required. Um, first of all, the student is considered dependent federally until um, they're 24 years of age. Um, so no, nobody's considered independent before that. Um, and as far as institutionally, it would, for us to not count a parent, it would have to be a documented situation um, uh, of abandonment, abuse, um, no knowledge of whereabouts, um, oftentimes a student might be in foster care or a ward of the court that would make them independent. Um, veterans, students with dependents that are actually caring for them themselves. Um, th those are, there's very specific criteria. The best resource to find that, I mean, it's on our website, but you could go to the FAFSA and the FAFSA actually um, lays out the criteria of what would um, have a student, how, what, how a student would be considered independent. If you're in a situation like that, I absolutely recommend calling the financial aid office and talking to a counselor um, because as much as we want to help you and, and treat you 
fairly within the analysis, there is a lot of federal regulation that surrounds that and often um, we need heavy documentation for that. So I would certainly want to speak to that person one on one. Great. Question here about um, if at the point of uh, being accepted and receiving multiple packages from different institutions, what if a student had a better need-based package from another institution than what Boston College offers? So again, I'll, I'll just sort of start off the answer there. And it does need to be an institution that strictly, uh, strictly abides by uh, need-based financial aid, no, no merit at all. Uh, and and so and also has to have the same kind of uh, need analysis essentially at Boston College does. So if if uh, upon you know certainly that would be something you'd want to appeal. You should bring to our attention. Uh, and if we indeed see that uh, it is a strict need analysis and there's a difference in the packages, Melissa, how what how would we proceed on that? Um. So as John said, um, we. This is need based, so we don't we aren't in the business of negotiating packages. But if, if it's from a university like Boston College, where they're need based, need blind kind of institutions, um, we will we we do want to know about those. Um, we try to make the need analysis as consistent as possible, but every school does things a little differently. So um, it could be that we are treating something more severely and we might be able to um, make adjustments. But so I, I would recommend mentioning that and, and submitting those award letters from other schools. But like John said, it would have to be um, a school that's doing need based and not offering merit because we just can't match the merit award. Excellent. Uh, Melissa, there's a question about uh, sensitivity to families that might have younger siblings that are going to a Catholic high school mm -hmm. or a private high school where a tuition is involved. Is that factored into the need analysis? Um, it can be, yes, absolutely. Um, Boston College does recognize that for students to be able to get into a college like BC, that often um, times, depending on where they're from or what the circumstances are, they have to pay to go to private school and that is a cost to the family. So. Um, there is an allowance made for that circumstance within the analysis. It's not a dollar for dollar, you know, chopped right off the income, but there is an allowance made per student. Um, we do allow that up front if we know about it. So, and there are opportunities um, on the profile form, the CSS profile to report that. Um, so, but if for some reason you think we're not making an allowance, certainly call and let us know and we can um, make an allowance for that within the analysis. Great. Uh, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask the expert. Um, what about it, what about just um, uh, pre-college siblings in general? The number of pre-college uh, siblings is is that factored into the need analysis in any way? Um, well, yes, we're taking into account the number in the household, and that every allowance made within the formula is based on the number in the household. Um, there's also an allowance made within the the, um, particularly on the asset side that accounts for money that is has been saved and should be being saved whether you're saving it or not we're protecting a portion of the assets per family per pre-college student so yes that is factored in it's a little more subtle and behind the scenes with the allowances that are, that are made within the calculation but um, yes we are allowing for pre-college students in the formula Next question is probably one that we can work together on because it sort of is the intersection of admissions and financial aid policy and it's around early decision. A student who's applied and been accepted early decision and uh, has applied for financial aid and the aid package is not what they anticipated, not what they expected. I think we can both agree that we, we, we would strongly urge uh, families that are pursuing early decision one or early decision two to use the net price calculator on our website to at least get a preview of what Boston College might be able to do. Uh, that's, a, that's a great resource. Um, but uh, if in fact, uh, you, you know, you've, you've received the package and it's not in accordance with what you expected, uh, as Melissa has said, you'd wanna appeal that with the financial aid office. If there is if there's additional documentation that could come in or if, or if we can offer greater flexibility, of course we would do that. But if we felt as though uh, our, our analysis was uh, correct, 
uh, and we were not able to adjust the package, uh, the admissions office would certainly work directly with the family. And if this was an insurmountable uh, difference between uh, expectation of the family and what Boston College can offer, uh, we would release the student from the early decision uh, agreement. Uh, we obviously don't want a student or a family here that doesn't wish to be here. Um, so uh, we're going to, again, try to be as fair as we possibly can. Because of our need blind, meet full need policy, we urge you to consider early decision. We would urge you to look at the net price calculator and use that resource very carefully. And if you've got questions about applying early decision, if you're going to be needy, by all means, be in touch with admissions or financial aid. But um, again, uh, take that early decision agreement seriously, and we will take it seriously as well, but we'll always work with you uh, to make sure that we have the, the, the correct outcome that's respectful of the family. Let me just check here for one more second. Uh, another question that probably I can handle. If a student selected for the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program has need beyond tuition, will the scholarship increase? And the answer is yes. If, if, if the student has need beyond full tuition, so our, our financial aid package, as Melissa has already covered, looks at the total cost of attendance uh, and, and, and looks at the expected family contribution against that total cost of attendance. So if you've qualified for a full tuition Gabelli Presidential Scholars uh, Scholarship, uh, but your need is greater than that, yes, there would be additional financial aid, but it could include, I'm sorry, we would, we would not offer a loan, I think, to the Gabelli uh, students. They would, they would be free from loans. Uh, uh, there would be work packaged, but, but the scholarship could indeed go up. So it would be uh, tuition based upon uh, on merit, but beyond that, it would be need-based and we would supplement the Gabelli Presidential Scholarship. Melissa, correct me if I've done something wrong there. Uh, no, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> She'll scold me later, I'm sure. No. Uh, it, we, like, we take the cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution and the need is met through er, any form, whether that's merit grant, you know, through the Gabelli, um, federal aid. So yes, if there was unmet need after the Gabelli filled um, that, then we would meet it with other forms of aid, yes. Terrific. Uh, that is it. The questions have been exhausted. Uh, thank you to our, 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 our staff members and team members behind the scenes that have been helping us uh, answer questions and, and send questions to me. Most of all, I want to thank Melissa for uh, an outstanding presentation, which I know has benefited parents and students alike. Uh, in closing, we both want to wish you good luck here as you pursue your senior year of high school. And as you begin submitting applications to colleges throughout the course of the process, we wish you good luck um, uh, on the admission side in particular. Uh, I think our most fervent wish for all of you is that while we're not able to welcome you to our campus right now, if you are admitted to Boston College, we certainly hope that we're able to run admitted student programming for you here in April, that we get to meet you face to face. I'm sure you certainly want to see these college campuses as well. That's our hope. We wish that all of you remain safe and healthy with your families. We hope that you continue to enjoy the rest of this weekend. We're very grateful that you've taken time on a beautiful weekend uh, to, to join this presentation. Uh, good luck with the process uh, and um, uh, continue to tune into Boston College for additional programming. Have a great weekend. Thank you.